Barbara Altman. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to be the director of the Oregon Humanities Center, sponsor of tonight's event. I'm just the first introducer of the real introducer, so I will keep this very brief. When we started talking about doing a series on the year of the book this year, um, Cornblue's name was one of the very first that came up, and we were determined to get him. It took a lot of work and quite a lot of time, but he very graciously agreed to come. And I have to thank for this idea two of our colleagues, James Fox from Special Collections in Knight Library and Carlos Aguirre from History. They were the ones who brought Peter Cornblue to my attention. And um, they were such good sports about being on the steering committee and giving us endless advice in, in endless meetings. And we were so pleased that we could arrange to bring uh, Peter Cornblue this evening. A couple of practical bits of information. After the talk, there will be a question and answer, and we would like to ask you to come to the mics in the aisles. That's because we are taping the whole lecture. We want to make sure we get your questions as well. If you can't come to the mic, we'll bring a mic to you. I want to make sure that you know that this is one of the events of the Year of the Book series, and there are still a lot of them to come, even though we're past midway in spring quarter. Out on our information table in the lobby, there's a blue flyer updated with the events are still to come. It's been an extraordinary series of events that went from theater to edible book art, to makers of books, to book artists, to uh, Robert Darnton on Google Projects, and everything conceivable in between. We have poetry readings still to come. There is still a play on it done by Theater Arts. And our other um, cleanup hitter, we have Mr. Cornblue with us tonight, and then we also have, as one last speaker arranged by us, we have Kwame Anthony Apia coming, who is um, president of PEN America and comes from Princeton University, and he will be speaking on May 26th. So if you'd like to keep up with what's still going on with Year of the Book, please grab a blue sheet or look at our website anytime, or the posters that are up around campus. If you wouldn't mind, if you've got 90 seconds for us, we have these yellow comment sheets on the information table in the lobby. And if you wouldn't mind filling it out, it helps us a lot to figure out where you heard about events so that we know where to concentrate our publicity and how we're actually reaching people. So if you've got a minute and you could fill out one of these at the end of the talk, they're out in the hallway. We'd love to have your input. I'd like to alert you to the fact that Peter Kornblum did a really great U of O Today interview with me this morning that will be up on, our, um, on the U of O channel within a couple of weeks and will be aired um, in three or four weeks. And you might also heard him on KLCC this afternoon. He gave an interview on the radio between 4 and 4.30. I'd like to thank a few people. This uh, bringing someone like Peter Cornblue is not possible without a lot of hard work. And so my thanks to the staff of the Oregon Humanities Center, Julia Hayden, Melissa Gustafson, Peg Gearhart, Lindsay Hendrickson, and our student assistant, Ty, who can be seen all around town on his bicycle posting our flyers. <laughs> thank you, Matt. <laughs> I hope that means you've seen the posters, or if you haven't, tell us where to put them. I also want to make sure to acknowledge the Oregon Humanities Center Endowment for Public Outreach in the Arts, Sciences, and Humanities. We wouldn't have been able to bring Mr. Cornblue without that very generous endowment. We thank those donors. They make it possible for us to do any number of things. They give us great liberty and trust us with their money, and we're just so grateful to them because it makes for a much richer program than we would be able to offer otherwise. All right, so that's all the practical information. I'm now going to turn the mic over to my colleague, my distinguished colleague for whom I have great admiration, Professor Carlos Aguirre from the Department of History who will introduce Peter Cornblow. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, good evening. On October 22, 1970, General René Schneider, the Commander-in-Chief of the Chilean Armed Forces, was shot in a street in Santiago de Chile. He died three days later. He paid with his life for his relentless defense of Chilean democracy and his opposition to any military intervention 
in the then quite agitated political scenario of his country. He was seen by conservative sectors as one of the main, if not the main obstacle to a military coup that would prevent the socialist Salvador Allende to be confirmed as president of the Chilean, uh, by the Chilean Congress. After hearing the news about the attack on General Schneider, the US State Department drafted a message that they suggested President Nixon should send to the Chilean president, Eduardo Frey. The text of this message was, Dear Mr. President, the shocking attempt on the life of General Schneider is a stain on the pages of contemporary history. I would like you to know of my sorrow that this repugnant event has occurred in your country. Sincerely, Richard Nixon. Stain, repugnant, sorrow, declassified documents have proven without the minimum doubt that Nixon, his Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, and many others in the US national security apparatus not only knew, but were acti actively involved in the plans to block the election of Allende. The CIA spent thousands of dollars funding an operation to get rid of the Constitutional General Schneider. Allende was elected anyway, just a few days later, but US efforts to oust him did not stop. Allende was eventually overthrown, as uh, all of you know, on September 11th, 1973, by a military coup that was possible only thanks to the political climate that the US had contributed to generate. How do we know about all the history of US involvement with the tragic events that unfolded in Chile after 1970? We know this because hundreds of scholars, human rights activists, relatives of victims, and survivors of state violence have made enormous efforts to document what happened in Chile and have done so against the powerful forces that wanted to hide the truth from us and keep the secret about their actions. But few have done more than Peter Kornbluh and his organization, the National Security Archive, to bring truth to light. Their 25 years of persistent and courageous efforts to unearth documents, declassify information, and bring truth to the surface constitute one of the most important contributions to the causes of justice, truth, and human rights made in this country over the last few decades. We are truly privileged to have Peter Kornblu with us tonight. He's one of the world's foremost experts in human rights documentation, and he has been instrumental in fighting the secrecy and hypocrisy of those that, in the name of democracy, have committed thousands of crimes against human beings, against the truth, and yes, against democracy. Peter is a senior analyst with the National Security Archive in Washington, D.C., and the author of many books, including The Pinochet File, which should be required reading for all of us who care about the cause of human rights and historical truth in Latin America and elsewhere. His talk tonight is entitled Information is Power, Human Rights and Archives in Latin America. Please help me welcome Peter Kornblum. <laughs> Thank you so much. Those are very kind words. I hardly recognize the person that was being described. Um, it's very kind of you all to come, and I extend my thanks to all the people that worked so hard to bring me here. I, I was here seven years ago. And Professor Aguirre invited me then on the 30th anniversary of the coup in Chile, and it's such a great pleasure to come back. Eugene, Oregon, as you who live here know, is a very, very special place and very different from Washington, D.C. <laughs> so it's great to be here. I um, want to tell you just for a second about the National Security Archive. Um, sometimes there's some confusion about which NSA we are. Uh, and um, we really wear three hats at the, at the archive. Uh, first of all, we're an archive. Um, we gather together documents, we obtain them through the Freedom Information Act, we 
uh, index them, scan them, catalog them. Um, we put them in our reading room and we put them on, on, on a digital, uh, in digital collections, uh, which we then give to university libraries around the world, and including uh, the library here, I'm told, has a digital subscription to our collections. And we empower uh, anyone who wants to come in and read our documentation. And a number of really interesting people have come in, including uh, people who are here and uh, former CIA directors and, and f retired ambassadors who are writing their memoirs and even a few assistant secretaries of state for Latin America uh, who uh, want to go back over some of the documents and somehow it's easier for them to find them in our collections than it is for them to find them in their own State Department. Uh, so they, they, sh they show up. Um, and we, we, we have the documents uh, there, uh, and we have the documents on our website, and we have the documents in our collections. We've done collections on Afghanistan, on the history of nuclear warfare, on El Salvador, on the Cuban Missile Crisis, on Peru is our newest collection, and the collection before that, the memorandums of conversations between Henry Kissinger and all of his staff and all the, the two presidents that he served. So those documents are there. That's our work as an archive. We are advocates for freedom of information. That is the second hat we wear. We believe, as Justice Louis Brandeis once put it, that sunlight is the best disinfectant, that abuses of power take place in the dark, and that when citizens can gain access to the information of their government, they can hold their government accountable uh, for the actions their government takes. And so we go around the world so we go around the country, then we go around the world preaching the gospel of transparency and the right to know. We have a very interesting sister website to, to our main website called freedominfo.org, which I invite all of you to visit. It tracks the progression of the movement for freedom of information around the world in every country where it is taking place. And I'm here to tell you it's taking place in quite a few countries. Now, we do have, as I mentioned at the outset, a problem with our name. And already today, several people have said to me, aren't you with the government? Don't you declassify the documents yourself? Um, and indeed, particularly in Latin America, where people hear our name in Spanish, Archivo de Seguridad Nacional, Suena Siniestra, you know. Uh, and there are people out there that think that we are the library of the Central Intelligence Agency, which of course we're the opposite. So we had to come up with a revolutionary slogan, which I take with me whenever I go to Latin America, and I'm gonna to show to you right now. <laughs> Documentos o muerte. And Sometimes I actually put this t-shirt on under my shirt and I unbutton my shirt and I do my Superman imitation and to show everybody the real work that we're, that, that we're doing. Um, we took this t-shirt, by the way, to Cuba and somebody said to me, you know, Fidel doesn't think that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and the third thing we do, which is really the activities that has brought me here tonight, is that we are what I like to refer to as forensic historians. We are human rights investigators. We ourselves can't find the bodies of the disappeared in Latin America, but we may be able to find the documents which say where the bodies are buried and who put them there. I like to think of ourselves at my office as the CSIs of history and human rights. We are investigating human rights crimes of the past, we are locating the scenes of those crimes through descriptions and declassified documents. We are making those documents available to people who need them and who can use them. We seek to exhume from kind of the dark vaults, the subterraneos, not the bodies themselves, but the documentation um, that can help solve the mysteries uh, of the human rights crimes of, of Latin America. And, you know, this work has taken us to many, many countries beyond Latin America. It's taken us to, from Chechnya to Chile, from Mexico to Liberia. We have worked with judges and lawyers and public prosecutors, um, human rights ombudsmen, obtaining 
U.S. military records, declassified CIA reports, secret State Department cables, National Security Council documents, um, and many other types of records, uh, including now records from Latin America itself, um, that will prove useful for the investigations that are being undertaken in the region. We have worked with legal individuals and we have worked with truth commissions um, throughout the region, uh, and not just in Latin America, but even truth commissions elsewhere. Um, but in Latin America, I can honestly say we have worked with every single truth commission to come forward. The first one was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of, uh, of, of Chile, uh, which was initiated in 1990 after Pinochet stepped down from power. The staff came to my office uh, pretty early on because there was one staff member who didn't believe that the Chilean secret police had murdered Orlando Letelier in the streets of Washington, D.C. in 1976. And the staff director said, well, the only way to convince you is to take you to Peter Kornblu's office and let him show you the declassified FBI documents, which say very specifically that Chile did this. And that was the first Truth Commission to come to our office. We worked on the UN Truth Commission for Guatemala. Um, and that work was particularly interesting. We obtained the declassification of Defense Intelligence Agency records on Guatemalan military commanders. Um, and the records that we obtained were a particular type of personal um, uh, biography type of record on each commander, which actually gave their posts and the time when they were posted there in particular commands, particular regions of the country. And through a, the database and computer work that we did, we, co we coordinated um, uh, the data on where everybody was posted with the places and dates of major massacres and human rights atrocities in Guatemala. And this database that we put together enabled the UN Truth Commission to be able to identify who the commanders of the specific barracks and regions were um, uh, in Guatemala for almost every significant massacre that took place there. It was work that my colleagues, Kate Doyle and Carlos Osorio did, and work that we were tremendously uh, proud of. We were proud of our work with the Peru Truth Commission, the Townsend Commission. Um, we started to work with them early on uh, as Fujimori uh, was uh, being chased from, from office through first political scandals. Um, we used the Freedom Information Act to get many documents, and we set up uh, meetings with the Truth Commission with the State Department and organized a special declassification on Peru of documents that would be youth useful to the Truth Commission. And in the end, over 400 documents were declassified that the Truth Commission used and then um, uh, actually kind of sent on to, to, to be evaluated for prosecutions of not only Fujimori himself, but other members of his corrupt and brutal regime. Most recently, we worked with the Ecuadorian Truth Commission, which some of you will be reading about. They're coming out with a final report on abuses that took place in the 1980s. They came to Washington. I introduced them to the Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America, Tom Shannon. Uh, and um, we got uh, the State Department again to do a special declassification for them. And finally, just a few weeks ago, I returned from Brazil, where they are attempting to set up a Truth Commission before Lula leaves office. Um, to finally examine the abuses that took place so many years ago in the 60s and 70s under the military regime there. But beyond the Truth Commissions, we have had the honor of working with individuals uh, in Latin America. And these are courageous people who are seeking the truth and justice and historical accountability on human rights crimes. These are widows, and sisters and daughters and sons and even grandchildren of the disappeared, tortured and executed in Latin America who are still trying to find out what happened to their loved ones all these years later. Sometimes 30 years later, sometimes 40 years later. It's, it's amazing. And who was responsible for what happened to them? And theirs is an effort to recover the past, to find closure and accountability for their families and their countries. In every country where we work, Human rights violations as far back as the 1960s had left an open wound on those societies. And those societies, those wounds continue to fester, uh, and they will continue to fester until the disappeared are found and buried 
by their families and until the torturers are identified and hopefully prosecuted. So obtaining documents in the United States and increasingly in Latin America itself is fundamental to that process of truth and accountability. Um, and I wanted to, by way of kind of moving into this talk, to introduce you to th three uh, individuals um, and victims that we have worked with them and their families who are pursuing truth and justice through the paper trail of human rights history in Latin America. And this first one is Rolando Orantes, the son of Benjamin Orantes Salada. Um, Benjamin is among the tens of thousands of disappeared in Guatemala during the era of military rule after the CIA orchestrated coup in 1954. Um, Rolando's parents, not only Benjamin, but Benjamin's uh, significant other, uh, were both detained in 1983. They were targeted by the secret police because of their involvement with the left, the guerrilla forces. Um, his father was seized off the street first. Uh, and um, executed secretly not long afterwards. And his mother was then detained based on information that his father had given up under torture. She was pregnant with Rolando at the time. And she was held in detention for a couple of weeks in Guatemala. Um, and then actually became one of the rare examples of someone that was, that was released. Um, after she was released, she took her newborn son and fled to Mexico and lived there for many, many years until 1999. And that was the year that my colleague Kate Doyle um, obtained and published what is perhaps the single most important and powerful document ever to emerge from the secret archives of Latin America. A document called El Diario Militar, kind of a military diary of repression, a logbook of activities by Guatemala's feared secret police that recorded the faces, dates, and descriptions of the fate of more than 183 victims of repression in, 19, in a six-month period in 1963. This was basically a productivity report on death squad operations. And here is one page of it with Rolando's father, uh, his picture at the, at the, at the top, um, right there. And you see that the description of the, interrog of the, of the detention, the interrogation, uh, et cetera. And my colleague Kate Doyle obtained this. Uh, it's a fascinating story. I won't tell it to you now. Um, she obtained this extraordinary document uh, with 183 photographs and descriptions of the fate of the disappeared. Um, and she published it in Harper's Magazine. This is a picture of Claudina. Uh, Rolando's mother, uh, right there in the middle. Um, she was also detained and she appeared in the book as well. Um, and when um, this was published, Claudina, living in Mexico with her son, saw it for the first time and she saw her significant other, Benjamin, for the first time um, in an official military book describing what had happened to him. And as she told Kate, my colleague who wrote a fabulous article in Harper's Magazine that I recommend to all of you, she said that when she saw this, it woke a kind of restlessness in me, a wish to do something. I think was, that was the moment that I felt a nagging feeling that I should act because I hadn't had the ability to do anything or talk to anybody about it. And a year later, she took her son, who was a, um, turning 20, um, and she went back to Guatemala and began working for a human rights organization. Um, and just a few years later, in 2005, this extraordinary archive, which I'm going to tell you about, was discovered. A massive, massive trove of records um, that included documents on the case of uh, Rolando's uh, father, including this document here. Rolando himself, and this is what makes this story so interesting, decided he wanted to be a researcher at this new, newfound archive. And so he went in and began working there. And he found this very document, which describes how his father was seized on the street and taken away. And the document is quite interesting for a number of reasons. But among them is that it, 
the actual typed text of it referred to the first person of the person doing the report. I witnessed this, I witnessed that, this is what we did. And son, one of his superiors edited this writing and basically said, we don't talk in the first person in these reports, we talk in the third person so that nobody can identify us as the perpetrators of these activities. This is the second set of individuals that I wanted to tell you about. The woman in this photo is named Sabrina Valenzuela Negro. She's from Argentina. The other young man, um, I guess over here is her older brother, Sebastian. Like Rolando from Guatemala, Sabrina uh, and Sebastian are the daughters and son of parents who were taken prisoner by the military in Argentina. Um, Sebastian was one year old at the time when his parents were, were taken prisoner and he was taken prisoner also as a, as a toddler. Um, their mother, unlike Rolando's mother, was not released but was actually executed after she gave birth to twins, one of them being Sabrina, the woman in this, in this photograph. Sabrina and her twin brother were among the approximately 400 missing Argentine grandchildren uh, who were born in detention, uh, whose mother was killed thereafter, uh, and then were secretly given up for adoption, mostly to military families, after their mothers were um, executed. For 28 years, she did not really know of her own true identity and her own true history. But uh, two years ago, she did learn, when she was 30 years old, the truth about her real parents. Her mother's name was Raquel Negro. Her father's name was Tulio Valenzuela. They had been held captive in a torture center in Rosario, Argentina. Um, and documents long hidden in Argentina told the story of their detention, but not only documents from Argentina, but documents that were found in Mexico City that have been crucial to her understanding and her learning about what happened to her parents. Human rights researchers led by my colleague Carlos Osorio discovered that Sabrina's father, Tulio Valenzuela, was a central figure in something that was secretly known as Operation Mexico. This was a clandestine Argentine rendition program, there's no other way to describe it, aimed at identifying, kidnapping, and disappearing leaders of the Montenero militant group who were living in exile, many of them in Mexico City. So, Tulio Valenzuela was coerced into accompanying a secret police team from Argentina to Mexico City. His wife, who was pregnant with twins, was being held captive in the same detention torture center that he was, and his one-year-old son was also being held captive and he really had no other choice since they were under threat of torture and execution but to go with this team to Mexico City to help identify his colleagues there. This is how the Argentines would do it. They would take a former prisoner, they would take a prisoner who had worked with these Monteneros, they would go to Mexico and have him basically sit in a cafe, make calls, point out the people that he recognized and then they would be targeted for, for kidnapping and elimination. And what was incredible about this story is that once in Mexico City, Tulio Valenzuela actually escaped. He escaped from their, from their custody. Uh, and he went to the press, talked to them about his wife and his children and, and this operation that he had been forced to become part of and he went to the federal police in Mexico and told them this story and they wrote this interrogation report on him which was found in the archives of Mexico. They then went and detained on the basis of his information, there's the cutout from this document, they then went and obtained, detained the two Argentine secret police officials 
and took their photographs and did interrogation reports uh, with them. Um, and so everything was, was going the way it should have gone, but unfortunately the story has an unbelievably heartbreaking ending. The Mexican police did disrupt this rendition operation. They detained and deported these two Argentine agents back to Buenos Aires, but they also returned Tulio Valenzuela to them and deported him along with them back to Argentina. And once they were back in Rosario at the detention, the secret detention center, um, the secret police agents, including these two and their superiors, decided that Operation Mexico had been, to use the vernacular, blown. Their operation had been blown. The Mexicans were going to expose this. They were going to perhaps file a formal protest. People would come asking questions. The press might arrive. They had to institute a cover-up. For them, a cover-up meant executing every single prisoner that knew about Operation Mexico. And the first two that were executed were Tulio Valenzuela and his wife, um, Raquel Negro, um, after she had given birth. They also, beyond that, executed another 12 prisoners that they had, all of whom were aware that this team had gone off to Mexico City. Several years ago, my colleagues found these documents, particularly Carlos, and did a big write-up from these documents from Mexico. He also found corroborating documents in an archive in Paraguay on Operation Mexico, and he also found US declassified documents that confirmed the existence of these types of operations that the Argentines were undertaking. Um, and he made these documents public in the United States and in Argentina. They became central pieces of evidence in a trial that just took place last fall in Rosario, where these agents that you see on the wall and their superiors were prosecuted and convicted. And my colleague Carlos went to the trial and testified in the photograph, that's him in the middle with Sabrina and, and Sebastian. Um, and he brought these documents, put them uh, before the court, and the documents uh, contributed to the conviction of these, of these individuals. But more importantly, perhaps, or at least equally importantly, the documents helped Sabrina and Sebastian to learn about their parents, who they were, how they lived, and how they came to die. And as Sabrina herself told my colleague Carlos, in a meeting there in Rosario. It is as though the documents enable us to touch them. And that gives you a sense of the power of these documents for human rights victims. This is a victim of human rights abuses who unfortunately we can't work with because he is the one US citizen among the 1,100 disappeared Chileans from the Pinochet era. His name is Boris Weisfeiler. Um, he was not a political activist. He was not a member of Salvador Allende's cabinet or government. He was not a prominent critic of the Pinochet regime. He was simply a, a Soviet, a Jewish Soviet immigre who had fled the Soviet Union because of anti-Semitism there when he was younger come to the United States, become a genius in mathematics, and received a very high appointment at the University of Pennsylvania, and was a semi-professional hiker who spent all of his breaks from the university hiking in, uh, in wonderfully interesting places. In 1984, he had been on the Incan Trail in Peru, and he had met some Chileans who said, hey, if you want a, a good hike, you should go south of Santiago in Chile uh, to the Peral region. It's beautiful, near the border with Argentina, mountains, rivers, gorgeous, you should go. And his next major break during the winter break of 1984-85, uh, um, he went to southern Chile with his green, hiking clothes, his maps, his compasses, uh, his backpack, which had Russian writing on it, um, 
his camera, his passport. And on the day before he was supposed to fly back to Pennsylvania from Santiago, he disappeared. His backpack was found uh, on the beach of the Nuble River about 10 days later. And the Chilean government of Augusto Pinochet announced that this American had drowned while trying to cross the river. Now, I have worked for many years with Boris's sister, Olga Weisfeiler. I'm sorry to say I don't have a picture of her. I should, but I don't. Um, she emigrated to the United States several years after he disappeared. Um, she never believed the story that he had drowned. He was a semi-professional hiker. Uh, there was no way he was going to go across a river by foot in the water uh, that he would not be able to forge. Plus, his backpack had been found on the bank of the river. It wasn't wet, and it was missing key things, like his camera and his passport, uh, and some of the other things she knew would be there. So she began to smell foul play and started to write letters, make requests, work with the University of Pennsylvania to try and find out what happened to him. And for more than a decade, she learned very, very little. And then in 1999, after Augusto Pinochet was arrested in London, and my office started working on getting the Clinton administration to declassify thousands of documents on human rights abuses during the Pinochet era, only then, in June of 1999, were more than 400 documents that she'd never seen before, read before, declassified. She and I started to go over them together, and they told an unbelievable story. I, I tell you, it was jaw-dropping. Um, it was so extraordinary. It had been kept from the family for 15 years, almost, by that point. And, let me just give you the, the highlights. There were indications that Boris Weisfeiler had been detained and beaten and eventually eliminated, as a suspect, as a, 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 a terminated, killed, because they thought he was a suspicious subversive, because he had maps, hiking fatigues, Russian lettering on his backpack. There were indications that he had been transported to a secretive compound near where he was hiking that had been started by a former Nazi named Paul Schaefer, who'd fled Germany when he was accused of abusing little boys, sexually abusing little boys, and had opened a cult uh, in southern Chile known as Colonia Dignidad. The Colonia had a long history of collaborating with the Chilean secret police. A number of people who were held there got away, identified Colonia as where they were held. Um, cars of the disappeared were found buried on the property of Colonia Dignidad. It was clear that it was an act of collaboration with the Pinochet regime. The documents showed that a CIA officer in Chile named Larry Penn had a source that told him that Weisfeiler might still be alive a couple of months after he disappeared. And then there were multiple documents, memorandum of conversations and transcripts of audio tapes of a, an informant from the Chilean secret police who called himself Daniel who told U.S. Embassy officials in 1987 that Weisfeiler had been taken to Colonia Dignidad, that the head of security at Colonia Dignidad had said, he's not a Russian spy, he's not a Chilean subversive, he's an Israeli Mossad agent here to, you know, spy on us. He's a Jewish dog, uh, and we should treat him accordingly. He was severely beaten, according to this informant, even as he insisted he was just a hiker in the wrong place at the wrong time. Most extraordinarily, Danielle said that in 1987, two years after Weisfeiler disappeared, that he was still, still alive and imprisoned at Colonia Dignidad. Now just think for yourself for a moment. You are Olga Weisfeiler, the sister of a disappeared beloved brother, and you are reading these documents 15 years after he disappeared. And for her, it was an overwhelmingly poignant, powerful, and infuriating experience. Poignant because these documents describe the harsh abuses that her brother suffered. 
beatings and torture and just awful things. Powerful because they actually gave her hope that he was still alive. This secret police informant said he was still alive two years after he had been taken prisoner. Maybe he was still there at Colonia Dignidad and it became her obsession and I kid you not, if any of you either have either known the families that disappeared or experienced this, ex this awful feeling yourself, you know that you just, unless you can find the bones, bury your loved ones, there still is some slimmer of, glimmer of hope that they might still be alive, and she latched on to this. And of course, infuriating, because the US government had kept these documents from her for all these years, and it basically kept passing on to her in response to her letters, the official line of the Pinochet regime that Boris Weisweiler had drowned in the river. And there was even a couple of other documents which are actually reproduced in my book, The Pinochet File, which indicated that the US Embassy in Chile in 1987, after this informant had come forward, had requested to headquarters at the State Department that they be authorized to spend $3,000 to hire a Chilean lawyer to officially open an investigation into the disappearance of this one US citizen in Chile. And the State Department had written back saying, you can spend the $3,000, but it has to come from your own embassy budget. And the financial officer at the embassy had then written a memo saying, we have no budget for paying this lawyer and the lawyer had never been hired. Those documents were among the 400 that were released as well, so you can kind of just imagine how upsetting it was. We took those documents, Olga and I, and we went to Chile in December of 2000. And we met with Judge Juan Guzman. He was already gaining fame for beginning to prosecute Augusto Pinochet, who had just returned from London after being under house arrest there for almost two years. We met with Guzman, I'll never forget it. It was in this barren police station where he had protection because he was being threatened for prosecuting Pinochet. He was so kind and gentle with the Weisfeiler family. I was there to translate for them, but he actually spoke English beautifully. Uh, and um, he, he really was, I, I, it's hard to describe, you know, He's supposed to be the judge, but he was almost the social worker at that point with them. Um, he basically told them that he would do everything he could to try and find out what had happened to her brother, but that he didn't hold out much hope and that she shouldn't either. Well, 10 years have gone by since then. A new judge is in charge of the Weisfeiler case. The head of the Colonia Dignidad, Paul Schaefer, was arrested and prosecuted in Chile for pedophilia uh, not for human rights crimes, and just died only two weeks ago. You might have seen the obituary in the New York Times, which described the Weisfeiler case. And there's another judge in charge of the case now. It appears that a local police captain in the Peral region is being interrogated soon and may even be charged with Weisfeiler's death. And hopefully we'll be reading news about judicial progress after a decade that has passed in the case soon. Just this last January, on the 25th anniversary, of Weisfeiler's disappearance, my office, the National Security Archive, announced that we would file a series of Freedom of Information Act requests um, to the Chilean government under the new Chilean transparency law to see what documents would come out of the bowels of the Chilean government archives and if they shed any light on what happened with Boris Weisfeiler and what the Chilean government did to try and find him. Um, I'm hopeful we will succeed because the recent history of Latin American countries shows that countries like Chile do have documents. They have archives. They have information that can help solve the mysteries of cases like the Weisfeiler disappearance. Now, up until about 15 years ago, when you talk to a Latin American about Latin American documents, whether you talk to former officials of the military regimes or if you talk to human rights victims and their families and you said, what about documents from your own country? And the response would be, no I. No I. Están desaparecido como las víctimas. 
They have disappeared like the victims themselves. They have been destroyed. They were burned. They were shredded. They were sent away secretly on a boat. We haven't seen documents from our own countries. They don't exist. And we don't have any hope that we will ever find them. And that was the standard response. And the idea that there were no documents from Latin America became one of the great myths of the military dictatorships, the Pinochet regime, of the, of the junta in Argentina, of the Stresner uh, military dictatorship in Paraguay, et cetera, et cetera. But let me tell you for the duration of the time that I have um, about how this no-I myth is being dispelled across Latin America. About 15 years ago, the first major archive was found in Paraguay, and it was found by this man, Martino Mala. Um, and it is the first truly great story of the recovery of history, the recovery of memory in Latin America. And finding an archive of a major dictatorship, the you know, dictatorship of Alfredo Stresner in Paraguay, um, that has shed light and provided evidence for various human rights crimes. Almada, who you see pictured here, looking through some of the documents uh, from this archive, was a, an innocent teacher. He was imprisoned and tortured between 1974 and 1978. While he was in prison, the stress and the toll that it took on his wife led to her having a heart attack and she died. She died while he was in prison and he always held the Stresner regime responsible for her death. And after Stresner was finally forced from power, uh, Martin set about using the legal system to build a case against the military men who had uh, contributed to the death of his wife. In December of 1992, he got a tip about an abandoned rural police station where there might be documents relating to his case. And he took a judge, and he took a TV crew, and he went out there, and there was one lone sentry, a guard, who said, no, you can't come in, and the judge said, you don't let us in, I'm gonna hold you in contempt of court and arrest you, and the man stood aside, and they broke the lock, and they went in, and they went up to the second floor, and the entire second floor was filled with documents. It turns out it was filled with 530,000 pages of documents recording the repression of the Stresner regime. Binders, surveillance tapes, interrogation reports, detention records, among them the records of Almada's own detention. And in the courtyard of this rural police station, there was a grave. And it didn't contain a body, but it contained hundreds of identity cards of prisoners who had been executed and disappeared. And Martin Almada, that very day, organized what you see in this picture, which was basically a rescue mission from the doc of the documents. He was worried that military officers would come and take these documents once they learned they had been discovered and uncovered and burn them, destroy them, uh, to cover up the evidence. And so immediately they organized a team of people, a human chain, started moving these bundles of documents out um, and into trucks and drove them directly to the Supreme Court building in Paraguay. Um, and there they were stored, and eventually, with the help of my organization, organized, scanned, uh, preserved, and disseminated. I and my colleague, Carlos, uh, in the early years after the, 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 the documents were discovered, uh, managed to talk the uh, democracy and governance section of AID during the Clinton administration into coughing up about $130,000 uh, uh, in, in US money uh, to go to preserving these documents and scanning them. And my brilliant colleague, Carlos Osorio, uh, designed a whole database program for them to be scanned, and they were scanned. Um, and now, this archive, which is known as El Archivo de Terror, has become one of the single most famous archives uh, in Latin America. It has been designated by UNESCO as a kind of a national and international historical treasure. Uh, and UNESCO has also put in money uh, to preserve it. The collection has been microfilmed, cataloged, and digitalized. On the George Washington University website, we have created a special 
site with 60,000 indices of the documents, not the documents themselves, but an actual catalog that anybody who wants to start to research can go to and use. It has become a huge, major, and multinational source of research information, not only for victims of human rights abuses in Paraguay, but for victims of cases in Argentina and Chile and Brazil, Bolivia and Uruguay. The archive has yielded extraordinarily sad, powerful documents like this one, um, which tells the story of a young woman who was arrested uh, with uh, her companion. Her name is Dora Marta Gil. Um, this is the kind of interrogation paper on her. She wrote a letter while she was in captivity to her captors, to the, to the directors of the prison where she was being held, basically saying to them in a, in a very naive and innocent way, because she really was naive and innocent. She had been a, arrested along with a colleague who was involved in leftist, act, leftist activities, but she herself was not, and describing in this letter you know, how she could get papers and he should go and talk to her parents, et cetera, et cetera. And you read this letter and it's heartbreaking because you're reading a letter of someone who really thinks that they're going to be released if only the right papers of her nationality and her work can be found and delivered to the people running this prison. And of course, she disappeared about two weeks after this letter was, was written. Other documents that have proven to be unbelievably historically valuable have been found in, this, in the Paraguayan archive. This is the original invitation from the head of the Chilean secret police to the head of security in Paraguay, inviting him to the first meeting of Operation Condor. This was a multilateral, cross-border uh, uh, program set up by the Chilean secret police and under Pinochet to bring the secret police services from the Southern Cone together to coordinate efforts against the left throughout the Southern Cone and indeed throughout the world. And an entire file of the original documents from the very first Condor meeting, the invitations, the, um, the program, um, the secret codes that they would use uh, to communicate among each other, uh, all the packet of information that would be given to anybody coming to this conference were found in the Paraguayan archives shedding extraordinarily li extraordinary light on, um, on Operation Condor. These documents were not found in Chile. They were not found in the United States. They were found in the Paraguayan archives. And let me turn from South America to Central America. The country least likely, I would say, for anybody who studied it to produce documents, um, and that country is, is Guatemala. The Guatemala that was governed from 1954 through the late 1980s uh, um, uh, into the 1990s by the military. Uh, plenty of time to, to destroy and cover up any records of repression. And the country, quite frankly, which is responsible for the worst excesses and egregious violations of human rights really throughout Latin America. Not a single other country measures up to the level of human rights violations that took place in Guatemala. Sustained death squad activity causing the deaths of over 200,000 people over a 30 year period. Many of them disappeared. And it was in Guatemala, as I mentioned to you earlier, that this amazing document, the, the death squad diary, uh, was first found. But now out of Guatemala comes something more extraordinary. The single largest archive of repression ever found in Latin America, and I would predict ever to be found in Latin America. The archives of the National Police, a, uh, an organ of repression that so deadly that it was abolished as part of the peace accords that ended the civil strife under the UN supervision in 1997. And these files were found completely by accident. They were in a, a munitions storage depot in really the middle of Guatemala City. And the neighbors had become concerned that there were munitions there that were not secured and that were gonna explode. And so they called the authorities and said, please go 
and make sure all the munitions are cleaned out of this depot. Uh, and they went and they cleaned them out and then the inspectors came to make sure that all the explosives were gone. And as they were searching the buildings to make sure all the explosives were gone, they came across five buildings completely filled, completely filled with documents like this. The New York Times described it as a giant trash heap covered with bat guano and rat feces. Documents bundled as thick as Bibles stand more than 10 feet tall in bat-infested rooms as dank and dark as caves. Thousands and thousands and thousands of these bundles. Bags and bags and bags of ID cards. Um, let me be clear about how extraordinary this is. This is one of the biggest miracles of historical recovery ever witnessed. By far the largest repository of police and state security records ever found. Up to, and even my mind can't get around this figure, 50 million documents. An estimated 80 million pages of documents that if you laid them out would cover 130 football fields. That is one long paper trail. So, over the last five years, extraordinary amount of work has gone into sorting through these records, starting to isolate the key documents that uh, tell the story of human rights atrocities, scanning them, cleaning them, which is amazingly difficult, um, and identifying which pieces can be used most immediately to prosecute human rights crimes. Five years has gone by. That really isn't a very long time in the history of archival uh, organization, as any archivist in any of the presidential libraries of, of even our country will tell you. And here, the team that uh, is responsible for this in Guatemala has basically cleaned all these documents, taken the, the key documents that they have found that are most important, and have started to use them. Just a few months ago, they announced with great pride in Guatemala that they had opened a public reading room at this archive, and that any Guatemalan or any international scholar or researcher could come in and have access to the documents that have already been processed and organized. Now, that's not the 80 million pages yet, but, but um, the thousands that they've already been able to triage and review. The archive is going to issue a full report on the holdings uh, and the human rights value of them next fall. And more importantly, these documents are already being used by international uh, prosecutors and by Guatemalan prosecutors to bring human rights cases. The documents have been provided to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is examining those 183 cases from the dossier militar, militar from the military logbook that my colleague Kate Doyle found um, for, for prosecution. Um, and prosecutors in Guatemala are also um, beginning to use these documents to bring cases. The most recent one, the case of a prominent labor leader, Fernando Garcia, who disappeared in 1984, and about whose murder documents have been found in this, in this archive. And we're gonna learn a hell of a lot more uh, about the history of repression, uh, and we're gonna see the process of, 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 of judicial accountability go forward in that country because of the power of these documents. The head of the archive, Gustavo Mionio, put it this way, we have great hope that this archive is going to clear up mysteries that have tormented this country for decades. Now I've told you about two unexpected archives that were just found in abandoned buildings. But let me also just tell you to conclude this kind of overview of, of the types of archives that are available in Latin America about the Mexican archives, which is certainly a much more traditional model of archives. Um, the Mexican Archivo General de la Nación is the equivalent of the National Archives of the United States. Uh, it is housed in a, in a former prison. It was first organized and opened in 1982. Um, it contains millions of pages of documents on Mexican history, colonial history, uh, more recent history. Um, and it doesn't 
make it out of the ordinary uh, for a country like Mexico to have such an archive. What does make it new and different is that in late 2001, President Vicente Fox, who was a cons from the conservative PAN party, decided that since his political opposition had ruled the country up until then, the PRI party, it would make great political sense to open the archives on the PRI's repression throughout the years. Um, and he ordered all of the security services to centralize their documents and turn them over to the Mexican National Archives. And after they had done that, seven months went by through during which the archive processed these documents. And in June of 2002, Fox held a public ceremony in the courtyard of the, of the archive and announced that he was opening tens of thousands of records relating to state-sponsored terror in Mexico in the 60s, from the 1960s to the 1980s. And these collections included the records from the Dirección Federal de Seguridad, the Dirección General de Investigaciones Políticas y Sociales, um, uh, and the Secretariat of Defense, basically all of the secret police and national security apparatus um, that had been involved in quite a few acts of repression and disappearances in Mexico, not the least of which was the famous massacre at Tlatelolco, uh, which uh, is still being studied and which we're still finding documents on. Um, and this has become an extraordinary resource. My colleague, Carlos Osorio, used it to find the documents on Operation Mexico that shed light and exposed what Argentina had done. There are tremendous records about anti-Castro-Cuban activities uh, uh, and the violence uh, of those groups that were uh, using Mexico as a base. Um, and there are thousands of documents uh, in this archive on the repression of the Mexican security forces themselves. In Mexico, people are going as researchers to this archive and they are finding these documents, but they're also using another mechanism, the Freedom of Information Act uh, in Mexico. And this is extremely important. Mexico uh, passed a, a Freedom of Information Act uh, in the year 2000. Um, my colleague Kate Doyle was on the committee that helped draft the law there. Um, the Mexicans decided that, like the United States, Mexicans should have the right to ask their government for the declassification of records. And they actually set up one of the most sophisticated Freedom of Information Act laws in all of Latin America. And what makes it extremely unique is that Mexico became the first American country to impose special obligations on the state to open documents that relate to human rights abuses. Article 14 of the law states that information may not be classified when the investigation of grave violations of fundamental rights or crimes against humanity is at stake. Um, this is a key clause. In practice, it certainly isn't always implemented, but in principle, it is there. And I should say that, you know, not even in the United States do we have a clause in our Freedom of Information Act law that identifies and gives priority to declassifying U.S. documents that relate to human rights crimes. This is something we need. This is something we need badly. We need a Human Rights Information Act in Washington that will designate the documents that are relevant to solving human rights abuses in Guatemala, in Brazil, in Bolivia, uh, in Argentina, in Chile, are given priority, are not withheld on national security grounds, and are released. I am promoting what I call archival diplomacy in Washington, where the United States can use, just as they use other tools of democracy and aid that they send to countries like Bolivia and, and um, Guatemala and El Salvador, um, just like they send economic aid and, and, and teams to help judicial processes and strengthen the police forces and all of that, they can use documents that have been lying in the dark classified in the archives of the CIA, and the Defense Department, and the State Department, the National Security Council, as diplomatic tools to help judicial processes go forward and solve the wounds of human rights crimes in Latin America. Um, th 
this is a, an example of a special declassification project that took place after Pinochet uh, was uh, released. Uh, it was imprisoned in, in London. Um, and this is the type of documents I'm talking about. In Chile, in the case of Chile, we did manage to get the US government to kind of elevate the issue of human rights to the highest level. And a whole team of people was assigned to find all the documents in the US government on Pinochet's human rights violations, including CIA documents, which turned out to be very, very potent. Uh, among the documents that were eventually declassified were documents about CIA covert op operations in Chile as well. And that gave us information on our own abuses of power. Um, but the documents on Pinochet's abuses were, were quite, quite extraordinary. Documents uh, from US archives have, uh, that relate to human rights have been used in the prosecutions of major figures such as Alberto Fujimori, seen here on one side as president and seen here on the other side as prisoner. Um, he was uh, convicted uh, a year and a half ago or so of human rights crimes committed in the name of, of uh, counterterrorism. Um, his conviction was ratified just a few months ago by the Peruvian courts. U.S. documents like this one played a key role in the evidence uh, against him. And here you see a, a document that is dated just after Fujimori took office, where the State Department reported that he had a secret plan from essentially the moment that he took office to have a public face of his counterterrorism policy against militants such as Sendero Luminoso, but to have a secret plan as well, which involved extrajudicial assassinations by special units of the Peruvian armed forces. And this document was used to help prosecute him. He was not the only president to be convicted uh, using US documents and using local documents. Um, the former president of Uruguay was recently convicted for uh, the crime of attacking the Constitution, um, Alfredo Bordaberry. Um, this is a document uh, that was used in the trial which linked him to the death under Operation Condor of an Uruguayan senator living uh, in, um, in Argentina. Um, and of course, this whole process of using documents to prosecute former leaders in Latin America began with Judge Juan Guzman, the same judge we met with Olga Weisfeiler, who indicted Pinochet for crimes of Operation Condor in December of 2004. I happened to be there in the Tribunal of Justice the very moment that he made the announcement that Pinochet would stand trial for the crimes of Operation Condor, and I can tell you that pandemonium broke out um, it was extraordinary. There were hundreds of family members of Pinochet's victims there, and they simply started dancing and screaming in the halls of, of justice, and it was just, uh, it was just uh, amazing. One of the documents, well, uh, let me just say that I gave Judge Guzman quite a few US documents to use in this prosecution. But one of the documents that he was able to use in indicting Augusto Pinochet was a Chilean document. This was a document that was found in the archives of the Chilean Foreign Ministry, even though it was a secret police document. It had migrated from the files of the secret police to the Foreign Ministry when Peru, in 1978, became the seventh nation to join Operation Condor. And part of joining Operation Condor meant an exchange of new attaches who would only work on Condor activities in the respective embassies of Peru and Chile. And when the new Peruvian attache arrived in Santiago, Chile to work on Operation Condor, the foreign ministry wanted to know who the hell he was. And he said, well, ask your secret police service. And so the foreign ministry sent a letter over to the Chilean secret police saying, who is this guy and what is he doing here? And the secret police sent back the original minutes and summary of the original Condor meeting, even with the signatures and names of the, those attending that you see at the bottom of the page there. Um, and this is how this document survived. 
None of the documents of the Chilean secret police have been found from Chilean secret police archives, regrettably, but some of the key documents migrated to other, to other files. And um, it is an example of how very, very important documents simply do not stay hidden forever. Now, Augusto Pinochet died before he could be prosecuted for Condor crimes and other crimes. But it is clear that the momentum that the efforts to prosecute him started in Chile has extended to the rest of Latin America. And I'm here to tell you tonight that you can expect to continue to read about prosecutions and documents and archives being found and used and processed um, in Latin America. A number of OAS resolutions have stated quite clearly that the right to know in Latin America is a fundamental human right. It is fundamental to the rights of human rights victims who need this information in order to find their loved ones and find closure uh, for the horrors that have been visited upon their, their families. It is fundamental to the rights of citizens to be informed about what their governments are doing in their name but without their knowledge. And it is fundamental to the future strength and health of democracy, not only in the Latin American countries, but in all of our countries. In January, and I'll close with this little story, in January I was in Chile, Santiago, for the inauguration of a new museum of human rights and memory. Uh, it is a, an extraordinary museum. I would hope all of you who are interested in this issue get to visit it. Besides the exhibits that they have, which are very, very powerful and include a number of documents, I must say, they are creating a major study center at the museum. Uh, they are acquiring massive collections of documents, including the declassified documents that we have obtained in our office on Chile, which will be brought to their office, uh, both in hard copy and on scanned disks, and used by students and lawyers and, and, and family members of victims in the years to come. Eventually, it's going to be a very special place with tens of thousands of records, a very, very special archive. As you walk into the museum, right after you get through the front entrance, there's a large plaque hanging on the wall, and there's a statement from the president of Chile, Michelle Bachelet, who herself was a victim of human rights abuses in Chile, whose father was murdered by the Pinochet regime shortly after the coup. And this statement reads on this huge plaque as you walk in, reads the following, we cannot change the past. All that remains for us is to learn from what we have lived. This is our responsibility and our challenge. The emerging archives on human rights in Latin America can help all of our societies meet that challenge and advance that responsibility. And I thank you for coming tonight. I've I've talked much longer than I was supposed to, so I apologize for that, but I'm here to stay and answer as many questions as we can. Hello. Um, my question is, what does it take to declassify a document, and who is classifying and declassifying these documents? Whoa. Uh, well, the United States has a huge Freedom of Information Act bureaucracy. In fact, every agency of government and sometimes uh, every office of, of agencies has its own Freedom of Information Act office and, uh, and officer. Um, under the Freedom of Information Act law, any citizen can ask for a, a document or a category of document to be declassified. That doesn't mean it will be. It just means that the US government is obliged to look to see if they can find the document. And if they do find it, um, review it for declassification. So you'll get 
junior officials, if you're asking the State Department for documents, you'll get junior officials from the FOIA office of the State Department reviewing the document. And they may say to you, um, you can have this, or they may say to you, you can't have it, or they may say to you, here's the document, but large sections of it are, are blacked out. Um, and of course, you always want to know what's under those blacked out sections. Uh, if you don't agree with the finding that either the document is blacked out fairly or that you can't have the document at all, you can then go to step two and appeal. Uh, and at that point, eventually, it may take years, your document is sent up to a different committee which reviews what the earlier decision was and makes another determination. If you don't agree with that determination, you can hire a lawyer and sue under our Freedom Information Act. Now let me just say that this often takes years. I was involved in a major request for documents relating to the CIA and the International Telegraph and Telegram Company uh, covert intervention in Chile. And 21 years had passed and the CIA still had not responded. We routinely have requests from my office in which the State Department, the Defense Department, or the CIA has not responded after seven, eight, nine years. Um, I think our oldest request now is about 15 years old. So every agency has a different approach and a different track record. Under the Obama administration, our hope is that this is getting better, faster, and more responsive because Obama has changed the Bush, the Bush administration's policies of erring on the side of secrecy. And of course, the Bush administration had a lot to hide and they wanted to keep it secret. And Obama has come in and literally the first thing he did on the first day of his presidency was issue new decrees on transparency saying the bureaucracy should err on the side of the right to know rather than on the side of keeping the document secret. So that's basically the, the, the process and, 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 and how it works. It's labor intensive, it takes a lot of time and patience. It works better if you know what you're asking for. Were these documents result in the prosecution of some of the perpetrators? I'm wondering what is the effect on those who are prosecuted, their families. I, I noticed in the newspaper the other day here in Oregon, they f somehow came up with information on a cold case of someone who had created a murder, who had done a murder 40 years earlier. And they, when they found out about it, the guy promptly went and shot himself. And that's tragic, and you wonder about the effect on the family. Um, other times, people maybe are relieved. They've been hiding this for so long, their crimes. And I was wondering, uh, we know how important it is to the victims to have the information come out. But what happens to when the, uh, the perpetrators are revealed? Are there, is there anger and retribution, or is it a relief? Or what, do you, what have you seen? Well, I have to honestly say that I haven't talked and debriefed too many perpetrators uh, on this uh, issue. Um, I know in the case of Chile, perpetrators have been identified and then they have then had groups of human rights victims come to their office, come to their house, denounce them uh, in a very public way. These are human rights victims who have just run out of patience with the uh, legal system. It's already been over 30 years. These people have been identified, but they're still going to work every day. They're walking down the block. They're, you know, it's uh, frustrating. And so they've been denounced uh, publicly in, in, in Chile, and that's created a, uh, scandals at, at, time, at times. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that there are quite a few people involved in human rights abuses in countries like Chile. For the most part, they were able to live scot-free without any accountability for many, many years. And because of documents and tenacity, the past has finally caught up with them. And so it should. So it should. Um, some of them are quite old now. Pinochet himself was in his late 80s. Uh, he, he was in his 
mid 80s when he was first arrested, but by the time he, you know, went back to Chile and, and went through all the prosecutions, he was uh, somewhat old. Some of he was getting close to 90 years old. And many people argued, he's an old man, leave him alone. We've had a, many instances of very aged former Nazis who have been found in this country and have been deported in their 90s back to France or uh, Poland or where have you to stand trial for, for atrocities committed during World War II. Um, they're quite old. Um, they've been treated as well as they can be for their age, but uh, there's a great importance for the history, for the truth, and for the dignity of their victims to see them have their day in court. I can't begin to tell you how many people in Chile were frustrated that Pinochet died before he could actually be convicted of the numerous crimes that he was charged with at the time he passed away. Thank you for an amazing presentation, Peter. Very powerful. I have two questions that I'm gonna pose in relation to Guatemala. Um, and this amazing contrast between finding this archive with, I forget how many millions of pages. Um, 80, 80 million, they 80 say. million pages. I, mean, I can't even. That's being processed. Yeah. So one question is, how do we explain those 80 million pages? What is it that leads to this documentation? <laughs> um, and secondly, in Guatemala and other countries, we have this contradiction of these archives that provide all kinds of information, but we also have ongoing repression and continued human rights abuses. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, what it's like to go research in that archive in Guatemala, in that, you know, in that kind of context. I wonder if you've had any discussions about that or, um, you know, how safe it is for people to undertake this kind of work um, and what kinds of precautions. Well, Guatemala take. is an extremely violent society. Um, it's violent not just because of the human rights issue, but certainly because of, of uh, the narco issue. Um, and the kind of chaotic situation there, as you know better than anybody. I'd say, f I have not been to this archive, but my colleague Kate Doyle has, and she wrote about it in Harper's Magazine, um, calling it in an article called The Atrocity File, which I would recommend to everybody. And, you know, basically for the theme of, of tonight's topic, I think it's one of the most extraordinary experiences you can have. You go in and you see this large team of people working away, and a number of them are, are family members of, 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 of human rights victims, and they are there putting their hands on the only thing that connects them back to their loved ones, uh, documents that they found and documents that they're looking for. And while they're looking for them, they're finding documents that are helping other families. And of course, there are a lot of professional archivists involved as well. And so the empowerment process for a country, for a group of people who have, for so many years were disempowered completely uh, by the forces of repression. Now these documents have turned the tide. They, they, they've shifted the, the, the empowerment process completely, in some ways, to the other side. And, and you have military guys, retired military guys out there wondering when the ax is gonna fall, you know, when the document is gonna surface that names them as the guy who dragged this this, this, this human rights lawyer out of his house and into an unmarked car and took him away and shot him and put him in a ravine or, or who stabbed the anthropologist um, Myrna Mack uh, in 1990 on the streets of, of Guatemala. I mean, they, they, those guys are all know about this archive. They all know that it is possible that their names are gonna surface and they're, they're having to live with that. that possibility. Whether or not they ever get prosecuted, they, they know that it is that is possible now. So it's an incredible turn of events and it is tells you what the power of, 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 of original documents really is all about. Not to mention, well, that's just on the prosecution side, not to mention that this is an archive that will be a living archive, a real archive, a monument to the history of repression in Guatemala forever. I mean, it will be, it is being put on discs, dips, discs are being duplicated and taken out of the country so that the collection exists outside of Guatemala as well. And this is gonna be something that 
anthropologists are going to study, students of this history are going to study, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of victims are going to visit. Um, I mean, it really is going to be a very powerful monument of paper, if you will, to Guatemala's past. And other archives in Latin America will play the same role as well. Okay. Uh, also, many, many thanks for coming again and speaking to our community here and stirring profound thoughts. Um, among those, the right to know, and you mentioned democracy, and I was just recalling having gone a couple of days ago to see the documentary about Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers. That's very, very good documentary. And Unbelievably I powerful. Comment on the impact of how Americans began to realize we have a right to know, and our government felt he was a dangerous man. That was for Kissinger called him this. the most dangerous yes. man in America. That's right. How many people have seen this this new movie? The most dangerous man in America. Some of you have. I mean, you have to have a, a, an interest in a few things: in the history of the Vietnam War, and the history of of opposition to the Vietnam War, and the history of of uh, government leakers, whistleblowers, uh, and in the history of government archives and secret papers. And of course, Daniel Ellsberg was personally responsible for not only for just leaking the Pentagon Papers, which was this official study. Uh, of the war that he had helped to, to, to write. Um, but not only did he leak them to, to, to one newspaper, I mean, he leaked them to half a dozen, and then he just kept making sure he gave them to a congressman, and he gave them to this guy and that guy. I mean, he just would not take no for an answer. And by the time he was done, these, these, these papers were so spread out around Washington and around outlets of, of the media that they just could not be contained. It was a true story of... Uh, of uh, whistleblowing on crimes of state, on lies of the government uh, uh, in, in such a significant way, and the futility in the end of the forces of cover-up and repression, essentially, of the truth to, to, to win out. It really was people's power at, at, at its highest moment, I would say, in, in the United States, and I just found that movie so very compelling. Um, and I think it's, I think if I understand the gist of your point and your question, it, it does remind us that we need to keep pushing to, to get these hidden histories out because our government has these, these histories still and they still, some of them are still secret. You'd find it interesting to know that it was around the issue of the Vietnam War that the whole Freedom of Information Act in the United States was written. And people were, the, 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 the Congress was frustrated, the Senate was frustrated, they just weren't getting a straight answer and what was going on in Vietnam. And they couldn't get any of the Defense Department under McNamara to give out any documents to the, to the truth. And, um, and US officials really were, had developed kind of rampant pathological lies about the progress of the war. And, and people started saying, you know, we need access to these documents and we don't have a law to, to get them, so let's pass a law. And first it was a pretty weak law and then it, had to be redone, it was strengthened a few years later and it eventually has been strengthened over the years and now it is the Freedom of Information Act law that we have, but in essence it was the catalyst for it was the frustration over the misrepresentation and lack of ability for us to gain information on Vietnam. Very, very interesting history which of our own country and our own evolution with, uh, with access to information that's, that's so important. Uh, my question kind of revolves around Panama and um, basically kind of our own implications of the invasion kind of in 1989 and possible like CIA involvement in um, Torrios' assassination. Like if any of those documents have kind of been uncovered. Well, let me say a couple of things. We were involved in the most fascinating Freedom Information Act case just a, a few months ago where a group of musicians got together and decided they would file Free Information Act requests for which of their songs and how their songs had come to be used to, as psychological operations to blast Noriega out of the, 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 the church that he was holed up in. And I don't know if those of you all remember this, but the U.S. military took these huge speakers and, and put them on 
uh, the lawn at f huge decibel volume and started playing songs that were that were being that were being um, spun on on kind of the, the the military radio through these speakers and they picked this playlist of various groups you know including progressive groups like Rage Against the Machine and I mean, I mean just just really interesting groups that 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 uh, and and some artists who who when they found out that their music had been played were like hey. That's an abuse of my music. And so when we filed these Freedom of Information Act requests and did the press release, I mean, this, it was the greatest um, publicity just because the story was so quaint. And uh, Johnny Cash's daughter, Roseanne Cash, went on the Colbert Report to talk about this because some of her music apparently had been used and she was irate and she wanted to, to know what had happened. There are a lot of documents about the invasion of Panama. Some of them have been declassified already. You'll find them, they're in my office, but they've been referenced and quoted in the book by John Dingus called Our Man in Panama. The whole idea that Torrijos was killed by the CIA, in my mind, is a myth that was planted in a, in a book that, frankly, I f can tell you is a bogus book called Confessions of an Eco Economic Hitman. Um, which I know maybe some of you have read and think has truth in it, but I can tell you has very little. Um, and um, there's no evidence that Torrijos was killed by anybody and by anything other than uh, a plane crash in bad weather. So, which is possible uh, and, 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 and likely. Um, but there are quite a few documents uh, to be read and anybody who wants to study um, what happened during the invasion, including the human rights abuses that took place when we, you know, mowed down the neighborhoods, the shanty towns and other neighborhoods and killed about 120 people who, quite frankly, didn't deserve to be killed um, in any way, shape, or form. Th that material is available also. Go ahead. Hi there. Uh, being that you talk about mostly things that are released from, you know, the years 1970s and 1980s, I wonder, um, being that we live in the computer age now, where the word document has basically become synonymous with the word file. Uh, and anybody who knows a computer knows that a file is basically anything that's video, audio, text, anything that you can put on a computer. Can the Freedom of Information Act in our country be used to retrieve video documents as well? And uh, there's a reason I ask this, because last month, I believe, there was a video that was leaked by a whistleblower in the military. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen this, but it's yes, a video. On a, on a website called Leaky, Leakypedia, right? WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks is the name of the Wiki website. Leaks. And it's um, a video that has been confirmed by the Pentagon as, as um, genuine that uh, it depicts um, two Reuters journalists being shot by a U.S. helicopter, and it had been requested in by Iraq. Reuters for two years, and the Pentagon yeah. wouldn't release it, but it was released encrypted by a whistleblower to this website. So I asked... Are video documents also legal um, documents? They are, they are documents, and they are products uh, of the, the government, and Reuters asked for them under the Free Information Act, and they were withheld. Um, and it's a classic case of them being withheld as a CYA measure to cover up a crime, mm -hmm. rather than because they contained anything that really would compromise U.S. national security. You know, what's happened now is that the United States government, and even under this administration, has def defined, you know, records of atrocities. If they get released, everybody will be upset with the United States, and that undermines our, our, our security. So we're not releasing a massive trove of photographs that, that the U.S. military has um, on abuses of prisoners. Uh, and Obama has sided with that decision not to release it. But yes, that is, those d documents, electronic documents, are subject to the Free Information Act. My organization sued the U.S. government to make email a federally protected record in its original form. And the court sided with us against the first Bush administration and the Reagan administration. And now all government agencies have to preserve their hard drives on their computers and turn them over to the National Archives as a hard drive. Uh, and email will be retrieved, and all sorts of electron other electronic records will be retrieved from them as a protected federal record that, that can't be destroyed, can't be deleted. Well, it's just kind of as an addendum, I guess. Do you think these documents will ever be released um, after they 
become, I guess, documents that wouldn't threaten our national security, as the Pentagon has said? I, I do. I, I expect that at a certain point, uh, a number of these documents will, 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 will be released, and certainly the older they are, the more likely they will be released. But what's important is that we know about them uh, and continue to press for them to be uh, declassified. That's something that you can do yourself uh, as, uh, as the years go by, is continue to press those, those cases forward. So, All right. excellent, thank you. Last question. Yeah, um, in 1985 when I moved to Eugene, I filed a Freedom of Information Act request and got 477 pages from the FBI from the 1960s. Mm -hmm. um, those pages also match your pages in the sense that they are government documents. The problem that I have um, is that I'm concerned about repression being increasingly conducted by private contractual agencies that are not official government uh, agencies. Uh, is this a problem and how do you go about solving that? Is there a way to get around that uh, impediment? Sure, it's a, it's a problem. I mean, Blackwater is not subject to the Free Information Act. so. We're gonna, you know, we can't use that mechanism. What you can hope for is that in judicial cases against Blackwater officials, a certain number of, of their corporate documents are introduced as evidence, and even if they're sealed, eventually are able to be released through the Justice Department or as part of the court process. But uh, corporations are not, um, are not subject to the Freedom of Information Act in the United States of America. In Chile, when they passed their Freedom of Information Act law, they did make semi-public entities who, who got contracts from the Chilean government also subject to the law. So there are other countries who have addressed, in some ways, the implications of the question that you asked by making other entities, private entities that have a relationship to the government also subject to transparency issues. We have not progressed that far in the United States of America as far as Chile has on, on, that, on, that, on that dilemma. But sure, you've identified a, a problem, uh, which is a real problem for, for accountability for historians um, and one that we'll have to work on. But I have to tell you, when you have a company like Blackwater or private contractors, they have a relation with a number of U.S. agencies. There's huge file in the State Department on Blackwater, a huge file in the CIA and the Defense Department on Blackwater. And there are investigative files on what happened also because these are contracts that we gave to Blackwater. We did evaluations of the contracts, we did accountability studies, we did all these things. And of course, when they were then accused of murdering people in Iraq, internal investigations were launched in the US government because of our relation, contractual relations with them all of those documents from our side are subject to the Free Information Act and would be extremely revealing, perhaps as revealing as getting Blackwater's documents themselves. Thank you. Thank you for coming.